Welcome to Learning with Lisa, Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast with Lisa Navarra, award-winning educator, consultant, behavior specialist, author, and parent. Welcome to Student Success Beyond Expectations, a very frustrated former educator of eighth grade students couldn't understand why they were reading on the second grade level, why their needs weren't being met. Lorraine Driscoll, who is an educational therapist and registered nutritionist, found out the why. She found out the why out of a need to help her students. She's here to explain specific strategies that you can use to help your child, to help your students, and maybe even to help yourself be able to function at high capacity, including those who have a neurodiverse makeup. So welcome, Lorraine. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your experiences, really have people understand what you were dealing with in terms of your own frustration and the symptoms, if you will, of behaviors and performance within the classroom that led you to where you are now. Right. So I taught grade seven and eight for many years and uh, started seeing right from the beginning uh, kids who were, you know, at grade one, two, three reading level and were crossing the stage at grade at graduation and still unable to read, um, you know, very, very limited literacy skills. And I remember shaking their hand at grad thinking like, my goodness, what's going to happen to these kids in high school? Um, you know, and the solution was always IEPs, medication, tutoring, um, assistive technology and workarounds. And I'm, I, all of those things are supportive. Um, they definitely have a place. Uh, but my frustration was that that was the only solution. And I knew from uh, even a family member who's very dear to me that that was not a positive solution once they got out into the real world and still had very limited literacy skills. It really affected their confidence. Um, they didn't apply for certain jobs that they probably could have applied for because, you know, they just felt so um, inadequate. Um, so basically, I trained in holistic nutrition early on in my teaching career, and that was a real eye opener in terms of, you know, the connection between what's going on with our kids brains, why there's, you know, a high, there's actually higher rates of learning disabilities among kids who have nutritional deficiencies, higher levels of toxins and so forth, as well as behavior disorders. So um, then journey took me with my own daughter who had severe sensory processing disorder, um, OCD, anxiety, ODD, ADHD, some of those were official labels, some of them not. And I started to dive into the world of functional neurology, which is basically the science of understanding why, what's, what, what is the function of the brain in terms of what's going on to cause the breakdown that these kids are experiencing and how can we correct that? Basically using the tools or science of neuroplasticity to effect change in the brain through different exercises and stimulations. Okay. So, so I want to slow you down for a second. Yeah. For those of for, for the listeners who are like, wow, this sounds really great. I, I want to understand more. So let's bring you back to um, what's going on in the child's brain. Can you, can you explain that a little bit? Yep. So uh, basically whenever kids have learning disabilities or behavior disorders and so forth, one of the big things that we found in functional neurology, um, and this is through like peer reviewed research and so forth, even done recently, is that 100% of the kids had something called retained primitive reflexes. Um, so those are like infant reflexes, for example, um, that should integrate by three years of age or sooner depending on the reflex. So there are these little reflexes, like, you know, you put your finger in your child's, your baby's hand and they wrap their fingers around and you think, oh my God, they love me so much. And it's actually a <laughs> reflex. Um, they totally love you, but it's definitely a reflex. Um, so that should integrate and disappear at a certain point. And there's other reflexes as well. And if they don't, then what happens is that basically these reflexes act as a obstruction to proper brain development. And so what happens is your child will then have a higher, harder time accessing their cortex. So a lot of the kids that I work with, and I know you work with Lisa, have difficulties with executive functioning, right? That's huge. Yes. And um, that's a big factor are these retained primitive reflexes that are making it harder for them to access their cortex and have that reasoning, planning, organization, impulse control, and so forth. So 
that's one example. Um, the other factor are things like brain imbalance. So typically these kids have one hemisphere that's overdeveloped and that's why you're going to have these twice exceptional kids. You have the kid who, you know, uh, like has amazing math skills, but like has such a hard time socializing, maybe can't make eye contact with someone or the other side of the spectrum where you have a kid who's very empathic, super social, you know, they're the one who's going to become a millionaire just because they know how to talk the talk, but they really struggle with literacy and so forth. So what happens is when one hemisphere is overdeveloped, it basically takes over um, the other hemisphere's job. And each hem hemisphere in the human brain has very specialized roles. So wow, we're talking about the brain here. And so far, I think our listeners can really follow along because you know there was a time and a place where psychology and the brain, it just, there really wasn't a place for it within education. It was psychology right. and it was education or right. something maybe outside of the school. But right. really what you're doing, Lorraine, is really educating of the why. And, and gee, you know, we might be thinking, well, my child, yes, my child is really, really strong in math. But maybe when it comes to social skills, very introverted. So these are types of things you want to start thinking about your students. These are types of things you want to be talking and thinking about your um, your children right now. Not that obviously we cannot diagnose, nor can you at this point, uh, but you can look for signs that you could talk with the teacher about. Teachers, you could talk to your parents about you know these these different areas of exploration to find out. Well, you know what? I see some patterns here, and I've done a little research after the podcast with Lorraine and Lisa, and I have found some great data. And so let's have a conversation now. Well, you might want to actually reach out to Lorraine for further information. So when we're listening to all of this, let's keep an open mind of how we, it's right in front of us. And it really is as complicated as it is. It doesn't have to be, it can almost be basic. So we yeah. can get to the right resources and really capitalize them for our children. So I didn't mean to interrupt. I just want to break it down. So yeah. that way they're really absorbing as much as they can, you know? A hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. So continue with us with, with the journey and, and the information uh, that we need to know about. Yeah. So yeah, those are some of the mechanisms in the brain that can affect, you know, learning and behavior. Um, another mechanism that we really address in terms of functional neurology is um, the timing in the brain. So what's been found is with dyslexia, learning disabilities in general, and even ADHD autism is the timing mechanism is not, um, a hundred, you know, hundred percent kind of on cue. Um, and that even applies to things like dyspraxia or court developmental coordination, you know, disorder, there's so many different names, depending on the state or province you live in. Um, so that'll affect all of that. So we work on improving the cerebellum's timing mechanism. Um, as well. So we work on all of these layers. And the big thing that was a huge, huge eye opener for me, I could not believe I didn't learn this as an educator is the body is what develops the brain, that the sensory motor system is the core or the foundation of our children being able to learn, read, focus, have attention, all of that type of stuff. And so we need to work on that sensory motor system first before we start doing all the other stuff. Um, there's some private schools that are catching on. I do a few screenings actually at certain private schools where we screen for all these lower brain levels the minute they enter JK. And that's not like, I'm the first person to do that. There's, I have a friend who, before I started doing this work said, yeah, um, you know, my private, my kid's school screens for these, um, primitive reflexes, these lower brain levels and so forth. And then we start exercising them because we know if this is not up to par, then everything else is going to be that much harder. And you can exercise these areas because why right. the brain is a muscle and exactly. we've so many people have heard that right but right. what does that mean like really what does it mean okay great it's a muscle i'll read some more hopefully i'll remember it i'll i'll, I'll repeat the person's name i was just introduced right. to five times and is that exercising you know but there are so many different strategies that, that can actually be implemented consistently that can make a difference in your child's brain so that way it's building up those areas of weakness and capitalizing on those strengths. So yeah. Lorraine, would you be able to give us maybe an example of what one of these exercises might be? 
Um, so a lot of them are physical exercises, so it's hard to kind of explain, you know, um, without demonstrating, um, let me think what's an easy one. Um, there's one, for example, that's known as a starfish. So a lot of kids with learning difficulties and behavior difficulties have a retained moro reflex, and that will basically cause them to have a hyper responsive fight or flight mechanism. And so for kids with learning disabilities, it might not be, you know, for example, that they're, you know, flying off the handle, so to speak, it could be that they just have higher anxiety. Uh, you know, it can be more subtle or it could be sensory processing disorder, which was the case for my daughter. So what we do with the Moreau reflex is we have the kids, they're sitting, for example, on a chair, and then they're going to starfish their arms out and their legs out, um, just like you would kind of like a snow angel almost. And then um, they're going to bring it in and they're crossing right arm over left right arm over left arm and then right leg over left and then they're bringing it back into a little ball and then you know um going back out and then going back and now they're doing the opposite side so I know this sounds really complicated uh, probably when I'm just explaining it um but basically that really helps to tone down the fight or flight mechanism over time the one thing I do like to say about these exercises is <sighs> Sometimes doing them, you know, alone can be helpful, but typically what we do, like in my program, we are working on all of the core exercises for so many weeks, because what's been found is that even if, if certain reflexes are fine with your child, meaning they're integrated into the nervous system, they're, they've disappeared, one helps the other one to integrate. So we want to do all of the core ones that are related to reading, learning, and behavioral difficulties regardless. Um, another exercise, actually, I'm just thinking of that's more simple. So a lot of our kids are fidgety. They have a hard time sitting still and the teacher will say, sit still and pay attention. And our kids can either sit still or they can pay attention. They can't do both because they have poor vestibular function. So if they are moving, then they're able to actually pay attention more. Whereas if they're sitting still, they have to focus on maintaining that stillness and then they can't focus on what the teacher is saying. So that's why we have these classrooms with these kids who need to move, which again is not a bad thing for these kids to be sitting on balls and these wiggle chairs and so forth. But my thing is, but what, why can't we get them to a place where they don't need to have to do that, where they can have that stability and they can sit still and pay attention. So one exercise, um, actually I'm gonna show the reflex first, it's called the spinal gallant Refl reflex. And the spinal gallant reflex will result in kids being fidgety, uh, you know, just having to constantly move. And these kids will also often be more sensitive to like, they'll be complaining about tags and seams, particularly around their waist. And one way to test if your child has a retained spinal gallant is you draw your finger down, you have them go on all fours, you lift their, their, their shirt and you drag your finger down the back of their spine on one side, and then you drag it back the, down the other side of their spine. And if they twitch or kind of move, sometimes it's kind of subtle, um, that's often an indication that they have a retained spinal gallant reflex. And so what we want to do is we want to integrate that very simple way to integrate that for most kids. What works is snow angels, literally like on a hardwood floor, they're just doing snow angels. Big thing with reflex integration is we want to go at a nice, reasonable pace. We're not going too fast. We're not going too slow. Um, and that helps to integrate that reflex. Uh, you know, I have a lot of kids, parents are messaging me saying, oh my goodness. I remember one mom saying he sat at his dinner, like a perfect little gentleman for the first uh -huh. time ever. Um, you know, like not that that's yeah. what she's seeing me for, but they couldn't believe where normally he's getting up and he's sitting down and he's just not able to sit at the dinner table to save his life. So, um, it's truly fascinating how much these reflexes. And I mean, that's just a tip of the iceberg, um, can affect, there's the skills that are necessary to perform well academically, socially, emotionally, and so forth. So talk to us about the child who maybe has autism, Down syndrome, you mentioned right. um, them before when we, when we were speaking. Um, well, really, any child that has difficulty following directions, you know, how do you get them to really use their sensory, manipulate their body? and follow step-by-step -step directions to be able to practice these exercises. Right. So, right. I've definitely worked with kids um, who, you know, are pretty um, like severe for autism spectrum. And sometimes what we have to do is mom will be on the floor with a child, literally moving their limbs for them. 
And that helps to build those pathways in the brain, build that muscle memory. And then slowly with time, that child is able to do those movements on their own at this point, then mom has to instruct and maybe guide a little bit. And then we're releasing kind of more control. And now mom may be not guiding at all physically, but she's still instructing and then slowly we're moving to the child being able to do it independently. And then the real test that a reflex or whatever it is we're working on has truly integrated is when they can perform the task or the exercise while they are talking about something else. That's what we call the cortex challenge. Uh, I want you to repeat that again, because you're saying integrated. Right. And yes, so this is something really important for, for everyone who's saying, okay, all right, I'm following along, I've got this, but now really by integrating it, I think Lorraine puts it in perspective for people to say, oh, things were not integrated. And this right. is what it seems like. So talk to us on, about that a bit. Yeah. So basically whenever it's integrated, that means that they're no longer operating on manual as opposed to automatic. So what I like to tell parents who have a child, for example, who's struggling with reading is they'll say, well, they can read, but it's really hard for them to read. Mm -hmm. And I say, yeah, it's like whenever you first, I, I remember this, whenever you first learn learning to drive a car, okay, you can maybe not drive that car, but you've got to have the music off. Nobody can talk to you. And you've got to think about every single thing you're doing. Right. And that becomes really exhausting. And so thank goodness, you know, we learn and this becomes embedded and it becomes integrated. And now we're no longer driving on manual, regardless of what kind of car we're driving, we're driving on automatic. We can listen to music. We can have a conversation. We don't really have to think too much about what we're doing. And so that's really what we, where we want kids to be when we're doing these exercises and any academic task in general, but particularly these exercises to start off with is that, for example, maybe the Moreau reflex exercise, like the starfish or the, um, you know, the snow angel, they can do that exercise and they can do their times tables, or they can tell you what they, you know, want to do this weekend for fun. They don't even have to think about what they're doing. It's so automatic. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very good explanation. So if you're listening, do you understand? Because if not, we want you to write some comments and we want you to really talk to us about this because that integration is really the passion throughout actually Lorraine and I, both as educators who saw a need and we needed to discover the why ourselves because we weren't taught it. And maybe you as the parent, you weren't born with this information. There's not that manual, manual. If there was, I really believe a whole big section on executive functioning would be on it as well as you know this integration. So I think that's very important to understand and understand the importance and the hope. So you might've felt like you've tried so many things and you're not done yet. You still wanna learn more. You just don't know where to turn because like Lorena said, you've tried the IEPs or your child has been pushed through or they're in special education, but yet you still feel like there's that information and those skills hidden underneath all of what clouds their ability to be fully able to be their best version of themselves and really the easiest version of themselves because let's face it, children who have a disability, they work so much harder at basic things uh, in comparison to their peers. And so that's what this is really all about. So can you talk to us about maybe somebody who you've worked with that um, just you'll never forget? Yes, 100%. Um, there's two that really stand out, but one uh, was a child who I say child, he was 13. Um, he was actually one of my first clients. Um, I was doing this new, or I was offered an opportunity to try this new reading technology that I was really skeptical about because I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, this is going to help. I was still in teaching at this point. Yeah. And um, I ran into the CEO of the company and she said, I'm going to give you some free tickets to try this out. Let me know what you think. I'm like, okay. <laughs> This child had uh, severe dyslexia. He could read five words when I met him. He had speech issues, developmental delays, sensory processing disorder, and ADHD. And I said to my to the mom, I said, I, I don't want to make any promises. I said, I don't know how this is going to you know pan out because this is more than your run of the mill dyslexia. And she said, even if it helps a little. So uh, we worked together. Within three weeks, his letter reversals um, declined by fifty percent. Wow. Um, for five weeks, he no longer had speech issues. 
Um, and then I would say within maybe two months, he was blending sounds like nobody's business. Um, and then he went back to school in September, the school reassessed him in October and he had gone up 15 reading levels, 15, um, 15 reading levels. So yeah. the school called and <laughs> asked mom who the tutor is and mom's like, it's not a tutor. It's, you know, whatever. Um, so that really sold me. That's when I was like, okay, I'm, I'm quitting my teaching job right? <laughs> doing this uh, full time. Um, the one other story I love to share it's so incredible is a 14 year old boy I worked with who was autism spectrum, pretty severe. He wasn't making eye contact and he wasn't speaking. And I was pretty new with this. So I was still like, Oh my goodness, is this going to you know make a difference? So we worked on detoxification, drainage, gut healing, and so forth. But when we started doing, um, like a listening program, like sound frequency therapy, he started speaking in non-scripted sentences and making eye contact. And he was 14. And the reason I love that story is because a lot of parents think you got to get it when they're three or four years old, which I mean, for sure, early intervention, I can't say that enough, but even if they're 14 years old, or I've even worked with 20 year olds, it's never too late. The brain can change at any age. It might take a bit more time, but it can totally change. And that's the neuroplastic piece of the brain, neuroplasticity. So yep. that's another area that you can also research and understand more of, because that's a part that's going to give you a lot of hope. It's going to give you hope that, wow, you know what? There is help out there now for my child. I'm learning something more, but here's also why, because the brain can change. And sometimes you might even get frustrated with yourself because you might be thinking, ah, I'm making a mistake again. Well, you know, there are certain strategies that we can use as well, right? Yeah. And to decrease that. And then that helps our own brain to be trained in the way that we need it to. So there's like a, a real life example for us. So if we can do those things, certainly our children deserve the opportunity to be able to build those areas. Yeah. So Lorraine, is um, there anything else that you would like to share? Maybe we haven't hit upon something that you would like um, for our listeners to know today? Um, you know what? The big thing is, I think, understanding, like one thing that I, a lot of parents will say to me whenever I jump on calls with them is they're like, well, we tried this and it didn't work. And I know that what they've tried is a really evidence-based approach. And I tell them it's all about right action at the right time. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really good interventions out there. Um, there's no such thing as one size fits all. You definitely want to be working with someone who, you know, honors and understands bioindividuality. Uh, but you also want to make sure that you're doing an approach that is right action at the right time. Um, because, you know, for example, I'll have parents who say we did vision therapy. We shot it like $10,000 and it didn't get the results we hoped for. And I'm like, well, did you integrate from the reflexes first? Did you work on vestibular function? Those are, that's really necessary for the ocular motor function to be optimal before we start doing the vision therapy. So just being aware of, um, if you feel like sometimes you're in that place, cause I know I was like that with my daughter is where you feel like you've lost hope or you've tried everything. Um, sometimes it's not the thing that you're doing that's wrong. It's the way we're going about it. Right. And you know, I, I, I like to actually integrate your educational piece, that hat, as well as with right. what you're doing now. So I had actually, you may have even seen it on TikTok and Instagram. I had a video of remediation. And um, for me, the way I see remediation, and would love to hear what you have to say about it as well, is the way that schools typically approach remediation is really reteaching. And when kids make progress, it's because they may have been developmentally ready at the time. So right. what you're saying, right? right? But what I'm saying is we can't call that remediation because if we want remediation, we need to focus on the problem. And exactly. typically when kids are not learning and they're really delayed, there's an area within the executive functioning that needs to be developed. So for me, remediation is teaching executive functioning skills explicitly to the students. A hundred percent. Okay. So do you have anything to add with that? Or do you pretty much feel like, you know, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. That was my frustration as a teacher is I was like, okay, if extra practice worked for a lot of these kids, they should be in a better place right now because a lot of the kids I've worked with 
they've had years of extra practice years, years, years of like extra tutoring more than their peers. They're working way harder than their peers getting, you know, C's, D's even worse. Um, and so forth. And extra practice is like, and I think because we were all raised with practice, 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 practice makes perfect. And I always say practice makes perfect. If you've got the right connections in place, right. Um, you absolutely need to have the right connections in place and you need to find out what's going on first of all, before we just start doing the, the kind of extra practice model. And I even caution people, I'll even go as far as saying, I even caution people with extra practice because sometimes we're re further reinforcing the wrong connections. So, uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And even as educators, if we don't know how to praise a student, we say, you're so smart. Oh, Luke, you got the answer right. right. Now we're moving them into a fixed mindset Instead mm -hmm. of saying, what strategy did you use that worked for you? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Something yeah. as simple as that can help to reinforce a, an executive functioning skill of the working memory of seeing a picture. Oh, well, I drew a picture. I saw a picture in my head. Yeah. I thought positively, what words should you use? And right. just tying in those explicit cognitive skills. Now it's not reteaching. Now right. it's remediation. And it's so unfortunate that schools don't know the difference yet. And I hope that this podcast will help that because parents, teachers, you're going to comment, you're going to reach out to us, you're going to talk to your administrators and your teachers, and you're going to do your own research and say, this is something I need to know about. And yes, okay, I had a professional development once on executive functioning or a class once on executive functioning, but no one else is talking about it. So maybe it's not a big deal. We're here to tell you it's a big deal. Yeah. It's your everything. Right. Yep. So anyway, Lorraine, thank you so much for joining us today, for sharing um, your information, your expertise. Where can the listeners find you? Um, I'm everywhere. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Instagram. Facebook. I have a website, LorraineDriscoll.com. Um, Building Better Brains or Lorraine Driscoll is where you'll find me on social media. Um, yeah, I'm on all the places. <laughs> so I'm going to ask that you send me some links so that our listeners can click on them in the description and we'll have them all ready for you because we want you to know there's more information out there. There's a lot of hope and change can be made. Thank 100%. you, Lorraine. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Student Success Beyond Expectations podcast, where school leaders, educators, and parents meet on behalf of children who struggle with learning.